So I'm now going to introduce our next speaker, who is um, Bob Furbank, who's the director of the ARC Centre of Excellence in Translational Photosynthesis at the Australian National University. And uh, Bob is going to speak to us about um, engineering C4 into uh, C3, C3 rice. Thanks, Rob. I'll just uh, go to share screen. All right. Can everyone see that okay? It's all good? Excellent. Uh, well, thanks, Rob. Um, uh, when John Lunn asked me to, uh, to speak at this symposium on C4 rice, um, uh, I was a bit um, uh, worried about what I should say um, I couldn't compete with Mark Stitt in terms of data richness of presentation, um, and I probably my jokes aren't as good as uh, as Howard's, but I could rely on Christine to give a really good introduction to food security and the importance of photosynthesis. So, what I decided to do was, since we're talking about seventy years of um, the Journal of Experimental Botany, was to do a bit of time travelling. So, um, I want to take you back to the origins of the C4 Rice Project, um, arguably the most um, ambitious piece of metabolic engineering to be undertaken in, in plant science, um, and one of the longest running funded activities in plants um, uh, from the Gates Foundation. So um, what I want to try and do is to give you some historical perspective of where the project came from, uh, how it evolved, um, uh, while we're working in rice uh, and give you a flavour for some of the progress that uh, we've made uh, recently and, and some of the technological advances that have really um, pushed the project uh, uh, towards the point where I think that uh, in the next five years we'll have a testable prototype. So why rice? Um, Rice is uh, a very important uh, food crop for the world. It's the number one source of calories globally. Uh, this is a little plot, uh, a picture of the globe that um, uh, Bob Ziegler, the ex-director general of URI gave me, um, which just shows uh, the percentage of calories coming from rice and right on Australia's doorstep in Asia, 70% um, of the world's poor people live there, um, living on less than $2 a day and 90% um, of rice is produced um, uh, right here. So, um, uh, the Gates Foundation and um, uh, the uh, C4 Rice Project is focused uh, solely on one thing, and that is to improve photosynthesis and yield uh, in rice. So Christine uh, introduced this quite nicely. I've got some uh, a nice old picture here of a wheat farmer in the 19, early 1900s in Australia. Um, it's obvious that uh, we don't grow wheat that grows above your head these days. Um, but as Christine said, um, uh, since the 1960s, we've really been um, standing on the shoulders of um, breeders like Norman Borlaug, um, who introduced the uh, gibberellin uh, insensitive dwarfing genes to wheat uh, and other researchers and breeders who did the same thing in rice. And what they basically did was it changed the way that the uh, plant allocated its carbon between structural biomass and grain. And as Christine pointed out, harvest index, which is the proportion of the biomass of the crop uh, that's um, uh, allocated towards harvestable product or grain in the case of wheat and rice. Um, uh, harvest index has um, been a very important target in the so-called green revolution breeding through improvements in grain number um, and grain size, but uh, mainly through this dwarfing and reduction in stature. But as Christine pointed out, the um, uh, really, there's been an asymptoting in, um, in using these uh, Green Revolution breeding uh, tools. Um, and we've reached a, a kind of stagnation in yield gain because in many of these elite uh, rice and wheat lines uh, that breeders are working with now, harvest index or the genetic potential for harvest index is close to 0.6, which is the theoretical maximum um, for both uh, wheat and rice. So. Um, just more recently, um, wheat breeders are finding that there's not enough photosynthetic push to fill the available grain, um, particularly with the challenges of climate change, drought and heat. Um, and uh, in rice, that realisation came about quite some time ago. And I want to step back in time a little bit and, uh, and talk about uh, when photosynthesis became a, a, a lead trait, if you like, in, uh, in rice breeding. And I think it's a really nice story. Um, 
back in the mid or early to mid 1990s, there were some amazing gains made in the rice breeding programs uh, in both uh, the International Rice Research Institute in the Philippines, uh, in China, and also in Japan. And in the space of just a couple of years um, uh, and a few crosses, um, the number of available florets or the number of, um, uh, of flowers, if you like, on the rice panicle uh, increased uh, extraordinarily. There was a 30% increase just in a few crosses uh, in the sink capacity, if you like, the amount of grain which could potentially be filled in rice. And that was um, looked at from a molecular viewpoint by, um, uh, in a beautiful paper by Makoto Matsuoka in Japan, um, and he had a look at these um, uh, historic varieties and this 30% jump in, um, in floret number. Um, and he found that um, it, co it was correlated with an increase in cytokinin levels. And in fact, um, the parents that were being used in these crosses uh, had a single point mutation in an enzyme called cytokinin oxidase. And this mutation allowed the panicle of rice to accumulate more cytokine and uh, induced more branching uh, and then more available florets. So this actually did improve rice yields, but not for very long. Uh, John Sheehy uh, at the time, he was uh, a modeler and a breeder at Erie. He found that uh, in many of these um, uh, so-called new rice idiotypes that Erie was breeding with, even though there was a 30% increase in their potential sink capacity to attract carbon, it wasn't matched by photosynthetic capacity. So some of their lines, because the number of juvenile spikelets had increased, um, the carbon that was fixed from photosynthesis was diluted between those uh, seeds. And as a result, the yield was actually less uh, because of abortion of seeds and lack of pollination. So the number of fill spikelets at maturity uh, often declined. So this drove breeders uh, in rice to start looking at photosynthesis as a frontier trait for improving yield far earlier than uh, we saw in, um, in wheat and in the other cereal crops where it's thought that uh, photosynthesis um, may have improved in concert with uh, our improvements in grain number and harvest index gradually over the years. So what came out of these observations? Well, John Sheehy became a bit of a pioneer of improving photosynthesis. And in 1999, um, uh, he um, ran a workshop at Los Banos uh, in the Philippines where he invited a whole range of different um, experts in photosynthesis to get together and talk about um, uh, redesigning rice photosynthesis. What could we do to improve uh, rice yields through improving photosynthesis? And this monograph to have a look at um, uh, many of the um, uh, traits or, or enzymes and, and approaches we're using now um, uh, are actually present in those early uh, presentations um, uh, almost 20 years ago. So how do we improve um, photosynthesis? We, no one was really interested in incremental changes. Everyone was saying, well, we really need to get um, a photosynthetic improvement that'll match that 30% increase um, in capacity to, um, uh, to provide a sink for that carbon. So um, what could we do? Well, one of the things that came out of that meeting and was subsequently pursued was the idea that, well, perhaps we could bring some attributes from C4 plants um, uh, into the C3 crop rice. And, you know, it had been known since the 1940s, of course, that these groups of tropical grasses, which include uh, sorghum, maize, uh, sugarcane, um, all have um, uh, superior yield, superior growth and biomass. Um, and um, in those early days, they knew there was something funny going on physiologically in regard to their uh, photosynthesis. But until 1966, no one really knew quite what. Um, so, Crops like rice and wheat operate with a C3 pathway that we've heard about um, uh, already today from uh, Christine and from Mark. Um, but the photosynthesis in C4 plants um, uh, allowed quite substantive uh, improvements in yield and uh, biomass compared to C3s in the same growth environment. So this was just a nice um, pictorial representation of an experiment that was run at Erie comparing maize grown in the same environment as rice. Um, uh, and in between those two crops, is a, a C4 weed that grows in rice. Um, and you can quite clearly see the difference in uh, biomass. And those numbers show you that um, almost 50% more grain is produced in the C4 crop uh, than in rice with the same intercepted amount of light. So this is getting at the photosynthetic efficiency uh, part of the equation as Christine pointed out. 
Um, of course, in Australia, everything's bigger and better than uh, anywhere else in the world. And uh, I love this old photograph. Um, uh, it shows bulrush millet, which is a C4 um, uh, millet. It uh, was grown as a forage in Australia. And um, 12 weeks after sowing, these guys had to stand on the tractor to actually see over the top of it. I'm not quite sure whether they lost their notebook or, uh, or the key to the tractor, but uh, I think they have a bit of a problem finding them. In the case of bulrush millet, uh, 80 tonnes to the hectare of biomass uh, with the same integrated irradiation that rice uh, receives during that same growing period. So it's no surprise that C4 plants, C4 um, uh, plants are the world's worst weeds and some of the most productive crops on the planet. So how do they do that? Well, we've already heard a little bit from Mark about uh, C4 and the CO2 concentrating mechanism, but um, I'm not going to show the classic Hal Hatch um, uh, biochemical diagrams because Mark may not believe it, but there are in fact some students that are afraid of biochemistry, uh, in fact horrified by it. So about 30 years ago, I had this cartoon drawn, um, which is a, a pictorial representation of how uh, C4 plants uh, supercharge photosynthesis. Basically, we all know Rubisco is a pretty poor catalyst, has trouble telling the difference between CO2 and oxygen. Uh, um, it has a very uh, poor KCAT. Um, photorespires, we've got to get rid of the uh, toxic photorespiratory products. So during the period in evolution where the atmospheric CO2 concentration dropped uh, far, far lower than it ever has in recent times, uh, C4 plants evolved a mechanism, a biochemical pump, whereby they could um, concentrate inorganic carbon uh, around the veins in specialized cells uh, to levels up to 10 times the carbon dioxide concentration in the air, um, thereby reducing photorespiration and putting Rubisco in an environment where it can operate at absolute maximum efficiency. And um, the elements of this pathway, of course, uh, were discovered by Hatch and Slack in 66. And in the following um, decade or so, the actual concentrating mechanism uh, itself was uh, delineated and um, I had the pleasure of being a postdoc in Hal's lab where we actually um, uh, quantified the amount of carbon that was in these so-called bundle sheath cells. So as a result of this CO2 concentrated mechanism, um, you could get basically a doubling of photosynthesis rates uh, in air at high light, half the nitrogen used per carbon fixed because you need less rubisco, and half the water used per carbon fixed because the stomates can stay more closed. So out of this um, uh, um, interaction between the world's photosynthesis experts and John Shi at uh, International Rice Research Institute came um, another workshop uh, seven years afterwards in which the whole C4 rice project really uh, was born. Um, uh, a program was put together and agreement reached that uh, we would try and take the elements of the C4 pathway from maize uh, and install them into rice. As I said, uh, even today, that would be considered a mammoth uh, achievement and a great challenge. With the tools that we had in the day, uh, you could almost consider it impossible. In fact, Hal Hatch said to me, Bob, don't get involved in this. It's too hard. It'll be a career killer. Uh, so I didn't heed his advice. I think I said, well, Hal, this process has evolved 60 times uh, over uh, centuries. It can't be that hard. Um, yeah, little did I know. But anyway. Um, the result of that meeting was that uh, a bunch of us got together. Uh, we went to the Gates Foundation uh, with a pitch uh, in 2008 um, to do exactly what I said in the previous slide, take up to 20 genes uh, from maize and install a functional CO2 concentrating mechanism in rice, not only with the biochemistry, but also with the transporters and the anatomical specialization required to make it work. So we put together 16 labs in 11 countries. Um, on, while we were heading to Seattle, um, it was probably the time when the planets aligned the best for getting any kind of project together to ensure global food security. It was the famous 2008 food crisis where the teeter-totter between um, food supply and demand had reached a point where we consumed more rice than we produced for the previous two years. We had um, 30 days worth of consumption of stored wheat grain globally because of a bad season in the Northern and Southern hemispheres. Rice prices went, uh, uh, doubled in um, the space of 12 months. Food rights in Cairo, I think, uh, I don't know, but I suspect Bill Gates had even written the check before we got there. Um, he called it his Apollo project. So it's like landing a man on the moon, but the payoff uh, is very high. 
So we're in phase four now. This project's been running for 10 years. Um, we've had a number of changes over that time, but phase one was building the toolkit. I like mechanical analogies, so finding all the parts that we needed to do this. Phase two was starting to put them together. Um, phase three turned out to be testing, rebuilding, fixing the things that didn't work. And now we're trying to put it all together into a testable prototype over the next five years. And I'll review a little bit how that um, uh, process is, um, is working at the moment. But before I go into the progress that we've made on the, the long road to C4 Rice in this 10 year uh, journey, I wanna review a little bit about what it takes to be a C4 Rice plan. So the first thing is uh, to, I want to focus a little bit on the biochemistry because I don't have time today to do both the biochemical and anatom anatomical specialization. Um, so from a biochemical perspective, um, as Rowan Sage will tell you, most of the genes that you need to establish a C4 pathway um, uh, or the genes encoding enzymes at the C4 pathway and most of the transporters are present in C3 plants. Um, they were just co-opted during the evolution um, to a different purpose. Many of them were used in uh, anaplerotic metabolism and uh, then were co-opted to operate in C4 photosynthetic flux. But what was required was a hundredfold upregulation of these genes. Uh, we needed cell-specific expression of those key genes because um, the thing about the biochemistry of the C4 is that you've got the biochemical CO2 pump and then you've got the Calvin cycle uh, and Rubisco, and they're in different parts of the leaf. Um, so we need those uh, enzymes expressed in the correct compartment, otherwise you end up with futile cycles like Mark was talking about. And those enzymes need to be regulated differently to C3s because the metabolite levels in a C4 plant are completely different to a C3. Anatomically, um, you can see quite clearly from the uh, diagrams above uh, in a rice plant, you've got, uh, for a start, very different vein spacing to a C4 plant, um, which is on the right-hand side. Uh, you have six to nine mesophyll cells between the bundle sheaths, whereas in a C4, you only have two or three, uh, mostly two. Um, the bundle sheath compartment in a rice plant has very few chloroplasts. They're pretty hard to find. Um, of course, in a C4, absolutely jam-packed because that's where all the rubisco is. So in the mesophyll, you've got PEP carboxylase, the primary enzyme of CO2 fixation in the C4. Uh, the C4 acids, which is why they're called C4 plants, move from the mesophyll into the bundle sheath. They're decarboxylated there, and that's where CO2 builds up. Uh, so you need that um, uh, specialized compartment with the rubisco and the Calvin cycle in it uh, for the CO2 to accumulate in. Um, so we've got so-called Cranks anatomy, which is that um, uh, close vein density uh, lots of chloroplasts in the bundle sheath compartment and there needs to be some kind of barrier to CO2 otherwise the whole thing would just be a leaky bucket. But the C4 acids have to be transported between the mesophyll to the bundle sheath to enable the pump to work. So there's a bit of an optimization process going on there and Susanna von Kammerer and I played around trying to model that uh, for about um, 20 years as well. Um, so this is the model of the installation of the C4 pathway that we're using in C4 rice, and that is the, called the NADPME pathway. Uh, there are three different um, uh, groups of C4 plants using different enzymes to decarboxylate the C4 acids in the bundle sheath. This particular um, uh, decarboxylation type uh, includes uh, many of our high productivity uh, C4 crops like sorghum, maize, and sugarcane. Um, this uh, involves the installation of um, uh, basically of five enzymes and then uh, subsequently a number of transporters that um, I won't talk very much about today. Uh, so the key enzymes we've been focusing on are carbonic anhydrase, which converts CO2 to the substrate of PEPC, bicarbonate, uh, phosphorylenol pyruvate carboxylase, the primary carboxylation enzyme, the other mesophyll located enzyme is malate dehydrogenase, which reduces oxaloacetate to malate. Then in the bundle sheath compartment, the malate gets decarboxylated by NADP malic enzyme. The pyruvate goes back and gets recycled to phospholinyl pyruvate by pyruvate PI dikinase. So fortunately, we know a lot about these enzymes. The genes have been cloned for quite a long time. Uh, so uh, as the little cartoon says, um, uh, we have to order the parts. Um, we actually knew what a lot of those parts were, 
but the trick was to getting them in the right place with the right amount. So one of the things that I was really fascinated about in this 10 year journey was how much technology had changed. And this is what's really given me hope that we'll get to where we need to go in the next five years. Um, I guess you've only got to look at your smartphone from 1999 to see the difference um, uh, in IT um, uh, advances we've seen. But we've also seen similar advances in gene technology and synthetic biology. When we started this project, um, basically what we were doing was taking uh, single transgenes, uh, transforming rice, which in those days was even quite a challenge. It wasn't a, um, a simple business. Um, we'd put each of those enzymes in a simple, separate rice line uh, and then we'd cross. So that crossing process uh, to get homozygous um, lines with five genes in them uh, took six years. And you can only guess how many hundreds of lines have to be looked at in that process. You have to be mental to figure out what the segregation of those lines is going to be because each one of those genes is at a different locus in the genome. Um, and at the end of it, unless you use many different individual lines uh, or events in the cross, you only get one plant you get one event. So if you want to have half a dozen plants to compare, you have to do six times uh, the work. Uh, if something goes wrong, if one of those enzymes stops expressing, you have to go back to that cross and start crossing again. So hugely difficult. And that work's just been published um, uh, recently in Frontiers in Plant Science. The thing that made the big difference in, was synthetic biology. And suddenly um, we could put all of these genes on one gene construct. Um, uh, we could synthesize the promoters, we could synthesize um, the coding regions, uh, we could domesticate them, which is changing the, um, uh, changing the um, uh, sequence of, um, uh, of the nucleotides, but not changing the amino acid sequence, so that we could then engineer them to fit together like a Lego set. So now we talk about building blocks, we go, oh, we've got level zero golden gate constructs, level one, and Rife are also using this approach. Uh, so are other Gates projects um, uh, to cut and paste DNA in ways we never thought possible. So the beauty of this is that we can do this in a year instead of six years. Um, we can regenerate many hobozygous lines so we can compare them. Um, and if something goes wrong, we can switch out promoters, we can switch out coding regions, uh, and we can use this test, learn, design, rebuild cycle that the synthetic biologists like. Uh, and use engineering principles to, uh, to get to where we need to go. So how's that going? Well, um, I won't talk about the single gene transgenic crossing paper. I'll talk about the re paper we recently um, published in um, Plant Biotechnology Journal. Um, at, we've regenerated a number of lines uh, containing pepcarboxylase, malate dehydrogenase, uh, malic enzyme overexpression construct, uh, for the bundle sheath, uh, pyruvate pedokinase and carbonic anhydrase, all on one gene construct. The mesophyll uh, enzymes were driven by different PEP carboxylase promoters, uh, and the bundle sheath um, uh, malic enzyme was driven by um, a bundle sheath specific promoter, in fact, from Flaveria of all places. Um, so the answer was this is the Western blot. Uh, we actually did all right, um, but not as well as we could do. We didn't get anything like maize levels of protein, uh, but the extractable activities of protein, uh, of those uh, enzymes were similar to the protein amounts. We did okay with PEP carboxylase. Um, we got very good expression of malate dehydrogenase, very, very low expression of malic enzyme. Uh, not bad with PPDK and not bad with uh, carbonic anhydrase. So we're on our way. But what is going on with malic enzyme? The bundle sheath expression of malic enzyme was extremely low. Uh, it was just detectable um, and more than wild type, but nothing to write home about. Certainly not even close to even a few percent of maize, for example. Um, these proteins were all in the right place. So we got the, um, uh, the promoter um, control, the transcriptional control of these proteins working pretty well. The measurable proteins were expressed in the same compartments as uh, they were in maize. Um, and uh, as I said, the big disappointment was, of course, uh, NADP malic enzyme. So what you're looking for here is the green fluorescence from um, the um, uh, tagged um, secondary antibody. So yeah, we're, they're all in the right place. 
So, but are they working? Do we actually have anything that approximates even a wobbly C4 pathway? So um, this is where um, uh, Stephanie, Mark and, and John come into the equation. Um, as I said, um, I worked in the Hatch Lab uh, early on. John Lunn and I were both there when uh, Hal would have a cigarette in his mouth in the lab, um, uh, spoffing around boiling hot ethanol uh, and carbon-14 like there was no tomorrow. Of course, we don't do anything like that now. Um, in fact, we do exactly the same thing, except we use liquid nitrogen, carbon-13, um, and um, uh, uh, tandem mass spectrometry to analyze um, where the carbon has gone in a pulse chase experiment. Uh, rather than a massive descending chromatogram with ammonia pyridine water in it. Uh, so yeah, it's a bit cleaner. The OH and S issues are less, but uh, yeah, not much is different really. Uh, and you can see here a picture of the setup um, in GOLM that we use to label up a number of these different lines and have a look at where the carbon was going. Was it going in through PEP carboxylase and where did it go afterwards if it did? So this is the bottom line, and it kind of reflects what we already knew in terms of the malic enzyme expression. Um, we were very pleased to see that we had substantial um, flux going in through PEP carboxylase and into the C4 acids. So that was pretty, uh, that was pleasing. Um, the first part of that pathway was working well, but the rest of the metabolites you see there show that there was no real difference between wild type and transgenic in the metabolites that were subsequent to the C4 acids. So the carbon wasn't really getting past malate and aspartate uh, and into any of the C3 compounds, which would suggest a functional pathway, or in fact, uh, into pyruvate or PEP and finding its way in any great um, amount of flux through a, a complete C4 pathway. So we've done a bit of it, but uh, we've got a long way to go. Um, we need to bump up the expression of our mesophyll enzymes as well, um, because even though the PEPC was 10 times wild type, it's still only 2 to 3% of the maize uh, activities. So we need to work on a few things. So the major roadblock at present in C4 ice and something that we're working hard on in Canberra is how to get more malic enzyme. Um, is it transcription? Is it translation? Is it protein stability? Is it there's not enough chloroplast to be a house for the malic enzyme to live in? Um, I think the answer is a bit of everything. So we've been bumping up transcription, bumping up translation, bumping up protein stability, and all of those things together uh, are getting us close to where we need to be. Um, and the problem of functionalizing the bundle sheath and making it more like a C4 bundle sheath rather than just a loading dock for sugars, which is what I think it is in, in rice, um, is a, something that we've also been working hard on. And this is just to refresh your memory. This is um, one of uh, uh, Florence Danilla's beautiful um, laser confocal images of um, uh, chlorophyll fluorescence, false colored uh, with rice. You can barely see the chloroplasts in those transverse sections of the rice bundle sheath, absolutely jam packed uh, in the ceteria. So um, we need to convince that bundle sheath that it needs to be more photosynthetic. So we did have some success with that, and this is a few years old now. Um, uh, Jane Langdale um, drove this part of the project. Um, she discovered a transcription factor in cytokinin signaling uh, many years ago that was involved in uh, bundle sheath development in maize. And by overexpressing this uh, transcription factor in rice, we found that we could in fact produce three times as many chloroplasts in the bundle sheath cells. And it also boosted the mitochondria uh, and the connections between cells. So it seemed to be pushing the bundle sheath towards a more metabolically functional compartment rather than just a, a bit of a useless bag of nothing. Um, and you can see that both on Tammy Sage's nice uh, TEMs and also uh, we've got, repeated the um, light microscopy using laser confocal to show the same kind of thing. Five minutes, Bob. So summary, we have all five C4 enzymes on one gene construct. They all express, they're all in the right place, but the malic enzyme levels are way too low. Um, we have labeling, which is commensurate with enzyme expression, but no evidence that there's much C4 acid decarboxylation, although we think there might be a tiny tad. We bullied the rice bundle sheath in being more functional, but it's still not good enough. So we're getting close, um, but we need to, to do better. I think I call it our first wobbly steps. It's kind of a, a wobbly C4 pathway. Um, what we do have um, uh, is something that might work for um, a partial C4 pathway. 
So what we have here is um, some modeling that Susanna von Camera did uh, some time ago, um, oh, well, last year, in fact. Um, and what she showed here uh, was that um, uh, if we model um, a C4 rice plant without the Kranz anatomy, without the close veins, um, what does photosynthesis look like? Well, what it looks like um, is that um, you do have a physiological effect. If we get C4 photosynthesis working just around the veins, we will improve uh, photosynthesis um, across the ACI curve uh, and we will improve it at high light. So we will be able to see a gas exchange phenotype um, uh, in these plants, even without uh, a fully functional Krantz anatomy. So a bit more Pepsi and this thing might start. The engineers um, might be able to uh, get this thing going after all. And, and um, I'm hoping that um, uh, this will be the case at the end of our five year uh, phase. So lastly, I'd like to um, uh, express my thanks to all my colleagues in uh, C4 Ice. Um, uh, I can't fit everyone on here. 10 years worth of work in such a fantastic consortium of, of colleagues. Um, it's been a real pleasure. Um, so I've just put people on here that, whose work I've presented, but I'd really like to dedicate this presentation to John Sheehy, who was the father of this whole thing. Uh, he sadly passed away last year, um, but uh, he'll be remembered as the person that launched us uh, on the road to C4 Ice. Thank you. Thank you for a fascinating overview, Bob. So uh, we're now ready to take any questions. So um, would anyone like to type anything into the chat box and I can uh, ask you to ask a question? Okay, so perhaps while we're waiting, uh, Bob. So so one of the questions I had is, I'm, I think I'm right in saying a lot of these enzymes are regulated post-translationally. Um, have you, observed any problems associated with post-translational regulation? I think it's too early days so far. I think we've been concentrating on expression level um, so far. Um, it seems like um, uh, protein amount in a Western blot um, has equated to commensurate activity. So that would suggest, at least with the level of flux that we've got, um, we're not running into problems with post-translational modification. But that needs to be put in the context of the fact that with these rates of flux, we're not going to have anything like the metabolite levels that we would have with a fully functional C4 pathway. So, for instance, um, uh, you know, malate levels um, uh, in, the, in the mesophyll to get malate the bundle sheath will be way lower uh, in these transgenic rice plants than they would be in a maize plant. So these are things I think we'll have to deal with in fine tuning. And interestingly, you know, um, <laughs> I thought, oh God, we'll have to go back and re-engineer things. But at one of our C4 ice uh, meetings, I think it was um, uh, one of our board members said, oh, don't worry, you'll just go back and edit um, the parts of the proteins that, you know, we'll just put in your regulatory motif from uh, another species and away you go. So um, yeah, there, there you are. <laughs> Thank you. So we've now got a question from Peter Nixon. Yes, uh, morning, everybody. Uh, it was a very interesting talk, and I was um, interested in the problem of expressing the, um, uh, the malic enzyme in the bundle sheath chlor chloroplast. And I was just wondering where, whether you'd actually express the GFP reporter um, to assess whether you can get good levels of expression or as a way of testing whether it's a generic problem with too few chloroplast numbers or whether there's something specific to the malic enzyme. Ah, yes, we've done uh, a number of GFP uh, fusion experiments and at the moment they've been somewhat inconclusive. Um, we know that our um, promoter and transcriptional strategy is driving expression in the correct compartment. We know that um, if we GFP tag the malic enzyme and we when we express it in um, a protoplast with a transient expression, it gets imported beautifully into the chloroplast, but we have yet been able to confirm that uh, the malic enzyme is imported and assembles correctly in the bundle sheath chloroplast. So we don't really know um, whether that's an, a problem with our detection system um, or whether it's actually a problem with importing that malic enzyme into the, the strum of the chloroplast.
So, Gavin, if I could ask another question, Bob, have you looked at um, how other factors other than photosynthesis might be affected, for example, water use efficiency or, or, or elements such as that? Um, not so far, but um, one of the things that's quite interesting is um, uh, we look long and hard at these plants for gas exchange phenotypes and, and physiological phenotypes. And there are some small phenotypic effects that are sort of commensurate with the uh, amount of flux that we're getting. But one thing we did see were there were changes in the dynamic response um, of the plants. Uh, when you go, say, from dark to light, where you change the light intensity, and also some changes that were reported in the paper uh, in the rate at which the stomates responded. And it turns out that um, some of these promoters that we use for bundle sheath expression uh, also express in the guard cells. So it's possible that um, uh, we're having some um, sort of off-target effects, you would uh, call them now if you are a gene editor, um, uh, where they're having effects other than uh, in photosynthesis. But, um, uh, you know, it, at the moment, um, the flux is, is low enough that it's, uh, the plants at the moment grow fine. If we have higher level malic enzyme expression where we can detect it on a Western block, uh, the plants are actually sick. They don't grow very well. So we're still investigating why that um, uh, might be the case at the moment. That would, would um, uh, suggest that uh, the malic enzyme uh, uh, in those more recent transgenic plants um, uh, is active in the plant. Um, otherwise, why would you see a physiological phenotype? You can certainly, in these new plants, extract reasonable activity and uh, see a good Western signal. Uh, so uh, soon we'll be labelling those up and seeing if that equates to flux. Okay, thank you. Um, we've now got a question from uh, Mustafa Sonmez. Uh, hi, were there any experiments about the C4 glycine decarboxylation uh, and how to implement it in rice? Uh, I'm not sure I quite caught that, Mustafa. Could you repeat the question, please? Uh, the glycine decarboxylation mechanism in ah. C4 plants, uh, were there any experiments to implement it in rice? Yes, um, uh, that... <laughs> It's interesting you should say that because the difference between the two experiments that we most recently published um, uh, in the uh, Golden Gate um, construct where we had uh, five enzymes in the stack, we had carbonic anhydrase. Uh, in the crossing experiment, uh, there, were, there was um, carbonic anhydrase wasn't included, but um, a, a glycine decarboxylase um, H subunit knockdown was included. So those plants actually have um, reduced glycine decarboxylase in the mesophyll. So, um, uh, yeah, that's, that's an interesting... Um, uh, yeah, so you're thinking that you might be able to make an intermediate, a C3, C4 intermediate by, um, uh, by that approach of putting GDC just in the bundle sheath. Is that right? Thank, yeah, yeah, thank you. Okay, we've got another question from Peter. Yes, uh, thank you again. Um, is, 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 there, is your knowledge of uh, C4 metab metabolism at such a stage that you can actually make pre predictions about theoretical maximum yields or at least predict what levels of enzymes you need to express in chloroplast to achieve a certain yield of biomass? Is, are we at that level of understanding? Oh. <laughs> we've got, um, uh, in my centre of excellence, um, uh, we've got um, uh, Alex Wu built a, a pretty nice model um, uh, built around a, a, it's called APSIM, it's a simulation, agri agricultural simulation model, which he's got running for wheat and, um, uh, and for sorghum at the moment. So it's, it's possible to plug numbers into that, but I'm not sure that we really have enough information. So you can say, well, if we made rice this much more C4-like, um, and you run the simulation so it adds the biomass up for the whole season, uh, it'll tell you how much extra grain yield you would get. But it doesn't tell you how much pep carboxylase you need to get that much grain yield. <laughs> you know, it, it doesn't drill down to the detail of the activity of individual enzymes. Uh, Jingguang Zhu has done um, uh, a reaction diffusion model, which we were hoping would drill down to that level of detail. Um, 
and it does to a degree, but there's so much uncertainty about metabolite levels and some of the kinetic par parameters of uh, the enzymes in the pathway in vivo that uh, I don't know that it really uh, could give you the information. But yeah, it'd be lovely, wouldn't it, to be able to say, yes, we're, this is our target. We know exactly how much um, of this enzyme to put in. All we can do at the moment is use um, other C4s to guide us. You know, this is the amount of, of malic enzyme in a uh, maize or a sorghum or a ceteria or something. But yeah, we don't really have that level of, um, of knowledge to predict exactly how much we need. Okay, thanks, Peter. So um, another question from me, if you don't mind. I mean, this is probably a little bit early days. And perhaps Christine might like to comment on this as well. But uh, clearly the, the end goal of, of both your project and the, and the right project is to, is to develop higher yielding crop plants. And, and have you started to look at or think at how these might be accepted or any of the regulatory hurdles that might need to be overcome or, or thinking downstream? I mean, I don't know, Bob, do you want to take that one? I mean... <laughs> <laughs> I could start, Christine, and then maybe um, you've got more recent experience. When we first got funded, um, I remember saying to the Gates coordinator, how's this going to go down, you know, with um, uh, GM crops? And um, uh, he said, oh, well, we've had a lot of discussions in the foundation about this, and we don't think it's going to be a problem. <laughs> so um, in the meantime, between then and now, I don't know, Christine, you've probably added up all the dollars, but the foundation must have put I don't know, three or four hundred million dollars into um, GM crop improvement programs. You know, if you add up um, photosynthesis in rice and C4 rice, um, biological nitrogen fixation, uh, cassava, um, uh, uh, the stuff that there's some other stuff going in sorghum. So they seem to be convinced that um, we we will be able to deploy these things in the field. Um, and I, I guess they're their views being borne out by the loosening up of regulations within Africa, which is their major target, Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, where GM, GM crops are becoming much more acceptable. Do you, do you have anything to add, Christine? I mean, I just think that it depends on where you want to, to, to grow them. I mean, I think Europe is a standout still at the moment, isn't it, in terms of being determined not to, to go down that, that track. But at the end of the day, I mean, I think I, I, I'm just paraphrasing something Steve Long has also said is that when you if we wait until we're allowed to have the transgenic plants and everybody accepts them it might be too late so you know having the seed on the shelf is is the way to go so I do think that um and, and I do think there is a softening we had no problem whatsoever when we put our SBPAs over expressing lines in, in Rothamsted um and, and you know and we had to have a lot of regulation and control over how, what we were doing but in actual fact there was no negative effects we didn't you know and, and the press were very supportive and everything so I think attitudes are changing and I think when people can see the positive benefits that can come out of them and things like CRISPR-Cas technologies and smart breeding and so on give us a number of different avenues so I, I, I'm not overly worried about that in, in, in the future although we still got some regulatory hurdles to jump over. That's very Thanks. encouraging at least. Uh, John a question from you. Yes, thanks Rob. So we heard from uh, Mark and Christine how the Calvin Benson cycle is uh, different in different species so in rice we expect it to be sort of optimized for a C3 situation so are we going to have to optimize it uh, in rice when we eventually achieve a C4 cycle? Oh, you like to ask me hard questions, don't you, John? <laughs> um, you, you, can, really you can pass it to Mark if you like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can hand it to Mark. Possibly, you know, at the moment, I think um, it, a fair bit of it might be um, uh, fine tuning. I, mean, I don't really know what's going to happen. You know, we've been debating, well, if we do get malic enzyme well expressed in the bundle sheath, What's that going to do to the redox state of the chloroplast? You know, is that going to make the chloroplast turn into maize chloroplast with low PS2 because they're producing so much NADPH? You know, if that happened, then perhaps everything might take care of itself. You know, the plant would modify its Calvin cycle and split it between the cells uh, because it had to. Yeah, I really don't know the answer. Do you want to, what do you reckon, Mark? I think Mark's dropped off the call as he had to go to another meeting. 
Oh, yeah, he has. Yeah. Oh, well, anyway, we, I'll ask him offline. <laughs> okay, do we have any? Oh, yeah, we've got a question from uh, Enrique. So you're just thinking, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a modeling question, <laughs> a bit of a theoretical question. From what is known so far and from what has happened in that um, initial attempt of those five enzymes, um, what would be top of your wish list? Um, the, the, the more enzymes through specific promoter uh, ac activity, uh, timing of promoters, uh, more bundle sheath chloroplasts, more veins with more such cells. What would be top of your list? Well, at the moment, it's getting that function, uh, photosynthetic functionalization of the rice bundle sheath to get that properly working, um, to get the decarboxylation step to work. I honestly think that um, with the way things are going, uh, what we're trying at the moment with uh, some of the symbio approaches with promoters, etc., and also. Um, you know, the incremental advances we've made um, uh, in protein stability, uh, transcriptional activity, they all seem to be adding up to suggest that we will get where we need to go to in amount of protein. But the bundle sheath compartment is a real worry, and I don't understand why it's, it's such a, uh, a roadblock for us at the moment. So that's what I want to fix is the decarboxylation step uh, and get that rice bundle sheath looking more like a a C4 bundle sheet. My wish list. <laughs> okay, so we've got one more question from uh, Keith Nagai. Yeah, hi. Uh, thanks for the wonderful talk. Um, so regarding the sort of the theoretical gains, if you achieve a C4 rice, um, so we know also that CO2, atmospheric CO2 concentrations are going to keep rising. Is this going to affect like the, the theoretical gains of um, when we achieve C4 rice? Is this sort of like a race against time kind of thing? Yeah, we get asked this a lot. Um, I mean, the like, I mean, Christine's point about um, you've got to really look at the environmental factors in combination when you're trying to understand whether a plant's, a C3 plant's ABP regeneration limited or a visco limited. In the case of a C3, you know, as soon as you stick it into a bit of drought and stomates close and the CI drops, rubisco becomes king again. And that's what happens too with C4s. If you're putting them, you know, the projected, the climate projections are for hotter, drier environments. Um, high temperature favours oxygenation of rubisco, so C4s are an advantage. Um, and drought and um, uh, operating at a lower CI puts C4 plants in an advantage. So I think even with increasing atmospheric CO2, C4s are still going to do better. Okay, thank you very much, Bob. And uh, I know it's, it's quite late where you are, so, so, so we'll release you now. Thank you for a fascinating talk.